In the 1960s and 70s, the Cold War was still very much, well, ongoing. And both sides were eager to get any kind of intelligence on the other. Naturally, the CIA was heavily involved in this, and had many a project trying to figure out exactly what the Soviets were up to at any waking moment. One of these projects was occurring in Iran, and it would result in a rather interesting sort of dogfight, kind of, that ended with an intentional mid-air collision. It probably goes without saying that the Cold War was kind of a mess in pretty much every regard, since neither side was eager to actually, necessarily, officially shoot at each other and start an actual war, which would devolve into World War III, but we were totally willing to influence other smaller conflicts and fight proxy wars by supplying advisors and trainers and other equipment to other nations. The general rule was, if a certain nation was communist, the Soviets would back them. And if the other side wasn't communist, we would back them. That's usually how it went. And while there were a handful of cases where our troops did become directly involved, it was pretty rare, all things considered, and never escalated to full-on nuclear war, though we were very, very dangerously close multiple times. In any event, though, the CIA was constantly working to keep a close eye on what the Soviets were up to. And during the 1960s, we're trying to get a bit more sophisticated about doing this, since the Soviets weren't exactly stupid, and were starting to get wise to the methods we'd used prior to that. At the time, Iran was actually a close US ally, as this was prior to their own revolution. The Shah of Iran, basically their king, was very much on the US side of things, as he was very worried about Soviet expansion and the fact that they had a very close relationship with the neighboring Iraq. Iran was also a lot closer to the USSR, so it was felt that it was incredibly important to lend them our support. We started loaning them a lot of equipment, in fact, very advanced equipment that wasn't offered to anyone else at the time, like the F-14 Tomcat and we trained them on their use. This also led to two CIA projects, which, okay, they are two projects, but they really might as well have been the same one, because they were so closely related and had the same basic goals anyway. One was called Project Ibex, and the other was the incredibly edgy named Project Dark Gene. Which, I mean, that sounds like a spy project, let's be fair. And that's pretty much what they both were. Despite how sinister Dark Gene sounds, it was mostly a spy game, just watching, gathering intelligence to use later. And they included listening posts being constructed in northern Iran by the CIA. In fact, both projects were still kind of ongoing when the Iranian Revolution happened, and Iran went from being one of our closest allies to one of our most notable enemies. The revolutionaries were staunchly anti-America, so things changed quite a bit, and suddenly a country that was completely against us had access to some of our best equipment because we had given it to them when they were our friend. You see how difficult politics can be sometimes? I mean, any country can do a 180 on us at any waking moment, it's ridiculous. Social media commenters make it seem like this was all so easy and if they were in charge, things would be different. But even just reading about some of this stuff is enough to give you a migraine, it's a nightmare. Anyway though, you're probably interested in this particular dogfight that I mentioned. And calling it a dogfight might be a bit of a stretch, because it implies that both aircraft were, you know, fighting, when really one was evading and the other was fighting. The incident took place on November 28th, 1973. And on the Soviet side, they had sent a single MiG-21 fishbed, which by that point was over 10 years old, but they were still very good planes, and the opponent they were dealing with wasn't exactly armed. On the American slash Iranian side of things, we had an RF-4C, which looks like an F-4 Phantom. It ain't. Well, it is, but this is the recon version of that plane, not the combat version of the plane. The RF-4Cs had a whole bunch of cameras for taking high-resolution images of objects up to 100 miles away. And, more intrinsically, they were generally flown unarmed. So fighting back against the MiG-21 was not really much of an option. 
The R-04C was actually being piloted by an Iranian, Major Shokonia, but there was a U.S. Air Force pilot in the back seat, as was custom, named Colonel John Saunders. The reason for this is that the CIA had thought of a cover story for why these planes would be in Soviet airspace if one were ever shot down, which was simply that they were on training missions and got lost. A lot of training missions and got lost. And they got lost all the time. You know, these Iranian pilots, they're new. You gotta cut them some slack, guys. It's, it's, it's just one of those things. <laughs> the MiG-21 was flown by Captain Gennady and Elisiv. And he wound up firing on the American aircraft with two K-13 missiles. However, incredibly, Major Shokunia was able to evade those, leaving Elisiv without any missiles. But ground control on the Soviet side ordered him very bluntly that he was to press his attack at any cost. And the MiG-21 was equipped with a cannon, but unfortunately for Elisiv, his was jammed. So he couldn't fire that either. But he had to press his attack at any cost, comrades. So, following his orders to the letter, he proceeded to press his attack by ramming the RF-4C. This act killed Elisiv and destroyed the RF-4C's tail assembly. It was the first jet-to-jet -jet ramming by a Soviet aircraft during an interception, and Elisiv was posthumously awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. But as for Colonel John Saunders and Major Shakonia, well, they survived, actually. They were able to eject, but they were captured by Soviet ground forces. The United States spent 16 days trying to negotiate their release, and eventually the Soviet Union decided to let them go, and both men were free to return home. And this is not the only time an American aircraft was shot down in association with Project Dark Gene, though it is, by and large, the craziest one given it involves a Soviet airman ramming another plane because his orders were very clear. Insanity, you guys. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune, 131 232, Josh Johnson, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Royal Videos, Hayden DeGrow, Lord Off 444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Travel Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hutton 2860, Icer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Alaric Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Joshua Long, Andrew Bowen, Prez Drenton, and Bradley Bowden. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.